All right, Judges chapter number 17, shorter chapter tonight. And uh, that doesn't always mean shorter preaching. If you've been coming here for any length of time, you know that's true. Uh, I'm going to try to keep it not very long-winded today. But what we see in Judges chapter 17 is basically just one simple story. And I like to, you know, I, I call this the story of the spoiled rich kid. Because it's really what we see in this chapter. And that, that's, you know, and I don't know how old this guy is. But basically, he grew up as this spoiled rich kid. We're going to see that in this chapter. Look down at verse number one. The Bible says, And there was a man of Mount Ephraim whose name was Micah. And he said unto his mother, The eleven hundred shekels of silver that were taken from thee, about which thou cursedst, and spakest of also in mine ears, behold, the silver is with me, I took it. And his mother said, Blessed be thou of the Lord, my son. Now, before we even get any further, there's a lot of things that's wrong in this story. The first thing we see is that he stole, he stole from his mother. And this guy's stealing from his mom. Obviously, there's no respect there whatsoever. When you steal from your own parents, your own mother, your own father. And look, I'm not talking about like my kids. They're little and they'll find like a dollar or a quarter or something in the house and go and put that with their money like this isn't the same this isn't the same thing that's happening here right most of them don't even understand that that's wrong you know we teach them not to do that but that's that's just little thing he's taking 1100 shekels of silver now when you read the bible i don't i can't tell you exactly how much money that would even equate to today i did some math on that but this is all, I mean, the, the, the price of, you know, silver and things like that, it, it fluctuates. And just according to today's standards, if I use the shekel as a weight and do a weight comparison and put that into troy ounces and then use today's silver and stuff like that, this is $6,000 just in today's, if you convert it all into today's money. That's a lot of money to be stealing from your mom. I actually think, though, that this is even more money. Because when you read through scripture and it's talking about, you know, a shekel of silver being, being used for various things. Um, well, I was just reading the other day in, uh, in the Bible, but in, in 2 Samuel, it was, it was oh, when, uh, when Absalom was hung up in the tree, right? And that soldier found him and he didn't kill him. He didn't do anything. And he went and told Joab, Right. And Joab said, you know, why didn't you kill him? I would have given you, I forget the number. He said like, you know, 10 shekels of silver or something like that, or 12 shekels of silver. He's like, I wouldn't have done it for a thousand shekels of silver. So he's using that as like a real extreme example of just, I wouldn't do it for, for that much money, right? So that's one of the reasons why I think this is probably even more than like six grand. Because he's just saying like, I mean, he's just throwing out this number out there like, I wouldn't have even done it for that because he heard what David had said about not hurting him, right? And he didn't want to go against the king's commandment uh, and, um, and all that. So when we see this just right off the bat, this is a lot of money that this guy steals. But then it gets even weirder because not only is he stealing from his mom and then he confesses and he says, Mom, remember that money that you were cursing about that, that you couldn't find and you know someone stole it or whatever? He's like, actually, I'm the one that did it. And then his mom says, Blessed be thou of the Lord, my son. Okay. <laughs> I understand not wanting to like press charges against your own child when they confess they've done something wrong, but you don't go and bless them when they've just told you that, that you know, they stole all this money from you. They stole all this silver from you. That's, that's not the right reaction. And what we see, you know, this, this guy Micah is all screwed up. He's got this house of gods. He's collecting all these religious artifacts. We'll get into that a little bit later. But he's basically, he, he has this life where everything's just handed to him. He's got all his collection. He's got all this stuff. He gets this, you know, a priest later on and he hires him just to live with him and everything else. He's got anything that you could want and he just is gathering up whatever type of idolatry his heart desires. He's stealing this 1,100 shekels of silver like it's nothing. And his mom's just like, oh, well, bless your heart, son. When, when he confesses that he stole it. 
And this is the type of, and this is a really important um, teaching that we need to hear more and more of today. And that's uh, this attitude of a mom that just can't say no or that can't ever correct or rebuke or discipline her child. You know, the mom who says, Not my, son. my son can do no wrong. And I don't know about you, but I've seen people like this before. It's, it's not, you know, this is, this is a, a story that rings true throughout the ages. There are moms out there that just will not ever accept or believe that their child can ever do anything wrong. And that is a very, very, very dangerous attitude to have as a parent. If you want to raise your child to be good, to be godly, to be righteous, to be a good person, to live a good life, to not fall into all kinds of wickedness and traps, and, and just fall for the love of money or fall for whatever feels good or whatever the case may be. Look, children need to be disciplined. They need to be punished. They need to be rebuked. They need to be chastened. They need to have this for their own good. If you don't, if you always are looking at uh, turning a blind eye, you're always looking the other way, you're never holding your child responsible for their actions, they're going to grow up and be horrible people. They need correction. The Bible says in Proverbs, turn to Proverbs, if you would, chapter 19. We're only going to hit a couple of these. There's a, there's a bunch of passages on this. But everything that we believe about how we live our life comes from God's Word. The decisions that we make, the people that we decide to be friends with, the people that we decide to marry or, or you know, the churches that we decide to go to, what we choose to do with our time, and how we raise our children, you know, all of these things are found in the pages of the Bible. This is truth. This is what we're going to go to for any advice that we have. If you want advice on raising your children, you know where you go? You go to the book of Proverbs. You read through the book of Proverbs. You know, it, it, it makes... <laughs> It's not that hard to figure out where to turn in Scripture for child rearing when you have a book where almost every passage is saying, my son, listen unto me. My son, hearken unto me. Listen to the law of your mother and, and the rules of your father. and Listen to, to this instruction from your father and, and, and don't depart from this. I'm teaching you wisdom. I'm trying to give you understanding. Listen to this. Listen to this. Listen to this. If you want to know how to teach your children, why don't you teach them from the book of Proverbs? You want to know how to raise your children? Look to the book of Proverbs. You want to give your children wisdom? Go to the book of Proverbs. I mean, yeah, the whole Bible is important, but there's different books of the Bible that are kind of geared towards different things, different bits of information, different pieces. And you've got a lot of knowledge in the book of Proverbs. And you want to know how to raise your children? Well, look at Proverbs 19, verse number 18. The Bible says, Chasten thy son while there is hope. You know what that implies? Is that there's going to be a point where there's no more hope for your child anymore. There gets a point where they, where they reach an age. Where if you haven't been chastening them, and chasten just means disciplining. If you haven't been rebuking them, disciplining them, chasing them, telling them that they're wrong, they're going to get to a point where even if you start to chasten them, it's too late. Yeah. There's just no more hope anymore. Right. Oftentimes, these are the people that are these habitual criminals that just can't stay out of jail. Yeah. Right. They're the fool that it doesn't matter how many stripes they get on their back, how many lashes they get, it doesn't teach them. They, they've gone beyond being able to learn from their mistakes. Why? Because they were never corrected as a child. So they grow up to be these people that just, well, I'm going to go out. Well, as soon as I get out of prison, I'm going to go out and steal again. That's all I know how to do. I'm going to go out and just hurt people and commit crime and, and whatever. You know, there's people out there like that. And I would say in the vast majority of cases, it's because they didn't have an upbringing. They didn't have a mother or father at home to teach them right from wrong, to show them the right way, to chasten them, to punish them, to discipline them. When you get it as a child, you don't need that much later on in life. You've already been set on the right path. You've already, as you start to swerve to the left, to the right, you've been corrected. No, this is the right way. You've been instructed. And from, and from the very early formative years, have been taught, no, I'm going to stay on this path because every other way isn't a good way. It's painful. And you, they don't even need to remember why. It's already been instilled in them from a young age. The Bible says, Chasten thy son while there is hope, and let not thy soul spare for his crying. This needs to be taught today. 
as much, if not more, than in, than in other time periods. Because we live in such a snowflake society and generation where everyone's so concerned about the feelings of others and, oh, you know, we don't, we, God forbid your child would be crying or upset, right? And most people today, a lot of people, they don't even want to deal with it. They, well, how can I get this kid to shut up and just give them whatever they want, yeah. right? I don't want to deal with, the, with how loud they're being. I don't want to deal with having to get the rod, chasing them, and take the time out. I'm too busy, got other things going on, so here, I'm just going to give them whatever to shut them up. That is the wrong way to parent. The Bible says, first of all, if they're crying, don't, don't let that bother you so much that you end up making a bad choice. Most bad decisions are made because they're emotional decisions and not logical, not, not thinking decisions. People react and are too impulsive. And women have a harder time with this than men do just because of the way that God built women to be more compassionate and loving, especially towards rearing the children. It's an important attribute to have, but moms need to, to make sure and keep yourself in check. And husbands need to keep their wives in check too, that you don't get overboard on not then chastening and disciplining your children when it's appropriate because of their crying, because you don't want to see them in pain, because you don't want to see them hurting. Well, you know what? A little bit of hurting is going to do them a lot of good. A little bit of hurting on their rear end is going to do them a lot of good. And you don't have to take my word for it. How about we just read Proverbs 19, 18 again. Chasten thy son while there is hope and let not thy soul spare, which means don't withhold because of his crying. Right. Don't hold back. Chasten him. Because if you wait and you don't do it early enough, there's going to be no hope. Turn to Proverbs 23. Proverbs 23 is probably my favorite proverb regarding child rearing just because it is so, so clear. And you ha in order to try to twist what the Bible's saying here, it, it's just totally obvious that you're twisting what the Bible's saying. I mean, people who want to say this, this doesn't mean what it says have to go to all kinds of lengths to explain it away and say, oh, no, no, this, that's not really what this means, to the point where it's just really obvious. You know, in some passages, you can be like a little skeptical. I don't know. That just doesn't sound right. I think it says something different. But you go, well, maybe. But then there's other passages where it's just like, you know, you just don't like what it says. You just don't like what it says. It's like 1 Corinthians 11 that's talking about the length of you know, men's hair and women's hair. When people try to go explain that away, you just don't like what it says. I mean, it's pretty obvious what it says. And this is another one of those passages. Proverbs 23, look at verse number 13. The Bible says, withhold not correction from the child. And this lines up with what we just read in Proverbs 19. Withhold not correction from the child. Well, what type of correction is that? Is he talking about a timeout? Is he talking about a shaking your finger at him and saying, no, 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 don't do that again? Now, I'm not saying it's inappropriate to ever do those things, but what the Bible is referring to in this specific instance, when it says to withhold not the correction, so make sure you're, you are doing this. Make sure you're not withholding this from the child. What is that? For if thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. He's talking about beating your child with a rod. And don't be scared by that word beat. It's not referring to, like today, we use that word, like if you beat somebody up or if your husband beats your wife or, you know, with child, like literal child abuse where, where moms or dads are, are injuring their children and giving them black eyes and, and, you know, actually doing harm, like damage to their children. That is abuse. That's, that's not what the Bible is referring to. That's not what we refer to. We're talking about beating your child. Beat is, the, I mean, to the most basic sense is just you're taking something and it's striking the child, right? And we strike the child in the area that God's provided that's padded, that yes, they're going to feel the sting, but no, it does not injure them. Because no parent should want to injure their child, right? We don't want that. Absolutely not. We love our children. But we do want them to understand and have the physical pain co uh, connection with what they've done wrong in a way that's not going to do them any damage, that's not going to hurt them. It's just going to make them see, you know, because you can tell them no till you're blue in the face. 
children aren't going to have an intellectual discussion with you and if you're trying to sit down with a three-year-old and tell them, okay, now these are all the, look, I'm, I'm all for explaining why kids do something wrong, but you can't expect a full change of behavior just by having a talk with them. That's not going to happen. They don't, they don't think at that level. You know what level they do understand though? That rod. They get that. All of my kids understand what that is. When they're acting up and if I say, if I say not to do something and they still don't listen, you know, as soon as I stand up, everything stops. I don't even have to get the rod. With the little ones, now they, when I just stand up, they all know. They already know it's not good for them. And you know, that's the way it ought to be. They need to understand that they can't just get away with everything. They need to understand there's consequences for their actions. And the Bible thinks that this is so important. God thinks this is so important that he says, not only if thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. Because look, we're not trying to inflict harm and injury on him. We're not trying to kill our kids. Okay, you're trying to correct them. You're chastening them. You're disciplining them. You're punishing them. You beat him with the rod and you know he's not going to die. He says in verse 14, thou shalt beat him with the rod. So again, I don't know how you twist that to, to, to mean anything else than thou shalt beat him with the rod. I really don't. I don't see how you can make that mean anything else. Thou shalt. Amen. Thou shalt beat him with the rod and shalt deliver his soul from hell. That's the importance that the Bible puts on raising your children appropriately by giving them spankings when they need it. It's so important that he's, he's equating this with it, delivering their soul from hell. Yeah. How important is that? Your entire life depends on it. Literally. I mean, it's an, an eternity of damnation versus an eternity of being saved. And you want to deliver your child's soul from hell? You know, teach them from a young age that there are consequences for their actions. Teach them that you can't just get away with it because the people who think who have never been brought up with that it's harder for them to even grasp the concept of an eternity of hell of any punishment especially a severe punishment like that so many people that they don't even don't even believe in God don't even believe hell is real and I'm not saying all none of them were ever disciplined appropriate as a child but I bet many of them weren't This is obviously not the way that Micah was raised. I mean, to steal that much money, I mean, you ought to be scared to death. My kids ought to be scared to death to do something that wrong. Because that's bad. And you know what? I do believe in different levels of punishment. And they ought to have that. God has that in the Bible. Different levels of punishment based on what the crime is. When my kids do something that's really not that bad at home, do I punish them? Yes. But is it the same as, as other things they do that might be really bad? Now one, one example of that is when my kids lie, that is a really serious sin in my house. Because that's something, that's a value that I hold really high. Our word, our integrity, what you say, right? And when, and when they do something wrong, whatever it is, Right, to break something or, or hurt their sibling or do whatever it is that kids do that, that could be wrong. They would get punished for what, they're gonna, what they did wrong anyways. That's, that's going to happen. But their punishment is 10 times worse if they lie about it. And then I find out why. And, and you know what? They know about that. When I say, do you want to get punished for lying or do you just want to tell me the truth and get punished for, for what you did wrong? Once they've gone through it, everyone needs to go through it once, unfortunately. They all need to experience it at least one time. Raise your hand if you've gotten a lying spanking. Yeah, all three of you did. They're not very fun, are they? Nope. But we need to teach our kids, you know, and make them understand that some things are way worse than others. And they need to understand the importance of these and that they, they need to, to learn well. And um, man, I just, I, you just cannot express this enough, how important this is. Parents or soon to be parents or whatever, you know, really take these words seriously and don't, and don't be deceived 
by this world's philosophy, by the psychologists out there that are going to try to tell you, oh, you're damaging your child when you spank them. You're, you know, just trust in God's word. Trust in the way that things have been done for thousands of years. Trust that, that what God tells us is righteous and true and that God knows what he's talking about. And that since God created us, he knows better than anyone else about what we need as human beings on this earth for our own benefit, which is why he gave us all the commandments that he gave us in the book to keep us from bad ways and, and lead us in the right way. And he's taught us how to raise our children. Let's, let's take these, uh, these proverbs seriously. Let's take this wisdom and apply it in our own life. Let's go back to Judges chapter 17 now. We'll go back to that spoiled rich kid of Micah. Rich because, I mean, he stole 1,100 shekels of silver and it was just kind of like, yeah, it was a big deal. But his mom's just like, oh, blessed be thou of the Lord, my son. And, and then she goes and we're going to see here, in verse number three, she says, And when he had restored the 1,100 shekels of silver to his mother, his mother said, Well, I had wholly dedicated the silver unto the Lord from, from my hand for, the, for my son to make a graven image and a molten image. Now, therefore, I will restore it unto thee. So she's basically saying, Well, I was already dedicating that unto the Lord for you to have a graven image anyways. I was already just putting that money aside to be, to have, to, for you to have a graven image. So here, just take it back. That's a lot of money. To just be so flip and just be like, oh, okay, well, here, just, just, we were going to give that unto the Lord anyways, or, or not give it unto the Lord, but we were going to dedicate it unto the Lord in order for you to have this graven image. So what they're going to do is they're going to pay someone to build an idol that he can, because she knows her son has all these idols and that's what he's into and that's what he likes. So she's going to help him get even more, right? His collection of false gods. His collection of idols. Well, son, I want you to have even more idolatry. So here you go. And I mean, 1,100 shekels. Now, obviously, we're going turn to um, turn to Deuteronomy chapter 4. Because this comes up multiple times in this chapter and in the next chapter, just the amount of idolatry that, that, the, that Micah has. And it's another thing that we ought not to forget. Now, this is just as applicable, I think, today, or at least pretty close to as much as it was back then. It may not be exactly the same form, but we still have a lot of idolatry out there today. There are a lot of people who are very deeply religious, and that's who Micah is. He's someone who's deeply religious without any knowledge of the truth or just very little. It's more of a superstition. It's a superstitious type of religion than anything based on, on truth. I'm going to read Exodus 20 for you just in the Ten Commandments. The, you know, the first two commandments, the Bible says in Exodus 20, verse 1, And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Now, remember, his mother said, I wholly dedicated the silver unto the Lord and follows that up with saying that she's going to make this idolatry, this graven image and molten images. And uses those words as graven image, molten image, which is exactly what the Bible says. I mean, the most basic element in the Old Testament on Christianity would be, what do you think, it's the Ten Commandments? Right. I mean, it's, it's pretty foundational, pretty elementary. And we're looking at what God carved in stone. And then you look at the first two commandments. And she's, they're claiming, oh, this is for the Lord. But you know what? This is how idolatry works. Especially the, the most prevalent idolatry that we see. It's all in the name of the Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ. They're going to say it's for the God of the Bible, but it's really not at all. Is Micah worshiping the Lord? No. He's worshiping false gods. 
He's not saved. His mom's not saved. They, they're not really trusting in God or in God's word. But they sure are using that name a lot. I mean, thou, the second commandment, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. And again, you, you, can't, you can't, you know, the Catholic Church always tries to, to turn this around, but they can't do it. I mean, unless someone wants to be deceived, they, they can't twist this and say, oh, well, here, here's why it's okay. Why is it, wait, tell me again why it's okay why you're making statues and not just making them, but bowing down unto them and praying to them? Why, why is that okay? Oh, but it's to the Lord. No, it's not. It's idolatry. God never said to make you statues like that. About the, in fact, he said the exact opposite. He said, don't do it. And, and well, doesn't the Catholic Church just hold tight to the Ten Commandments? I, I don't know how many times out soul winning I've had people say that are Catholic, that are actually you know, trying to be Catholic, not just your average Catholic that doesn't even go to church or doesn't really know anything about the Bible or, or the religion at all because it's just how they were brought up and they never go to church or anything like that. But the people who actually do go to the Catholic Church, what do they say? Well, I'm, I, I follow the Ten Commandments. I, know, I can't tell you how many times I've heard that. Well, I follow the Ten Commandments. That's why I'm going to heaven. Do you have a, do you have a statue of Mary? You're not following the Ten. You broke the Second Commandment. You broke the first two commandments. Just right off the bat, number one and number two. When you're bowing down to the Mediatrix, that's what they call her. It's another intercessor between us and God. You have to go through Mary to get to Jesus. We don't, we don't need to go through anybody. We go straight to Jesus. Amen. Jesus is the intercessor for us. Right. Not Mary. Right. We don't need to go through anybody else. But anyways, I don't want to get too far off onto that. Um, Deuteronomy chapter 4, look at verse number 14. The Bible says, And the Lord commanded me at that time to teach you statutes and judgments, that you might do them in the land whether you go over to possess it. Take ye therefore good heed unto yourselves, for ye saw no manner of similitude, on the day that the Lord spake unto you in Horeb out of the midst of the fire, lest ye corrupt yourselves and make you a graven image, the similitude of any figure, the likeness of male or female, the likeness of any beast that is on the earth, the likeness of any winged fowl that flieth in the air, the likeness of anything that creepeth on the ground, the likeness of any fish that is in the waters beneath the earth. And lest thou lift up thine eyes unto heaven, and when thou seest the sun and the moon and the stars, even all the host of heaven, shouldest be driven to worship them and serve them, which the Lord thy God hath divided unto all nations under the whole heaven. This gets even more explicit about, you know, what things you're not supposed to be making graven images of. And it just spells it out in even further, in, in more detail. And he explains also earlier in verse 15, that, look, you didn't see what God looks like. You didn't see the similitude. You didn't see what God's likeness was. You couldn't see anything. They saw the glory of the Lord. They saw a thick, dark cloud. They could not see God. So they're saying, don't go and just imagine things up and make these graven images and call that God. You don't know what God looks like. He's definitely not looked like, like these creatures and these things that you want to make a God out of. Saying, so don't make anything. Idolatry is extremely serious. It's an extremely serious sin that shouldn't be taken lightly. Just like I was saying, you know, raising your children is extremely serious too and you shouldn't um, withhold correction. Well, idolatry is similar just when it comes to sin and us being uh, right with God and what, what idolatry will lead to. You're not chastening a child is going to lead to all manner of sin and, and their heart not respecting a lawgiver not respecting someone who has rules for them and not understanding the punishment. In Romans chapter 1, we see the power of idolatry and turning people away and ultimately becoming reprobate because they've, they've turned unto these idols. Idolatry can cause someone to just completely reject the Lord because they made up their own God. We don't want to be anywhere close to that, my friends. And, and these, the sin of idolatry, 
It needs to be railed against fiercely. Because I'll read it for you. Romans 1, verse 21, the Bible reads, Because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. So you've got some people that they know who God is, they understand who God is, they hear the gospel, they hear about the Lord, but then they choose to turn from Him, to reject Him, to want to have nothing to do with Him. And in so doing... It says, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. So when they turn from God, they turn unto these idols and they make themselves these idols to worship. Why? Because they want to be religious. They want to have a God. They want to have that feeling of spirituality. They want to have a good feeling inside of them. They want someone, some higher power to tell them that what they're doing is fine and they're good and everything's going to be okay when you have hard times. That's actually who the atheist is talking about when they say people need a crutch. Right. It's the people who want to turn from the true God and just make themselves some God that's going to fit whatever mold they make it into. Because that's what you're doing when you make an idol. You're molding, you're fashioning, you're shaping your own God. You're forming your own God. Right. Well, this is how I think God should be. Yeah. I think God's kind of like a cow. You know, a cow gives, you know, milk to her young. A cow is very passive. A, a cow provides food. And, you know, so I think that's kind of what God is like. And then you're, we're just going to make this image, an, an idol, idol, and we're going to worship this idol and say that that represents God. That's creating your own God out of your own heart, out of your own wicked heart, your own imagination. And it's not true. It's, a, it's, it's false. And what we see in Romans chapter 1 is that when people reject God, they turn to these idols. And then as a result, other people will, you know, that aren't reprobates will still end up turning to these idols. And it's just a, a bad path to, uh, to go down and of course the reprobate path when they, when, God, uh, when they give up on God when they change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things that's when God gives them up unto uncleanness God says oh you're going you're gonna to turn me into, into a creature like that I'm going to turn you into a creature like that see when, when, the, when the, the human being decides to turn God into an animal God turns the human being into an animal. And that's what, that's what it's saying. Because then they get involved in all these wicked acts that humans weren't made to do naturally. And they end up doing things that only animals do. They get, they get the heart of a beast. And that's why they go after strange flesh. That's why they do perverted things. That's why they do these disgusting things. Because their, turn, their heart is turned into a heart of an animal. go back to Judges chapter 17. I think we've only gone through the first three verses. So we've got the spoiled rich kid Micah stealing money from his mom. Mom's not disciplining him. Mom's not punishing him at all. And then, and then basically when she finds out he stole it, he's just like, oh, well, I, I was giving that to you anyways. For you to just buy your idols and just, and just enable him to continue down his, his path of idolatry. And then we see, though, that mom is really just a spiritual talking hypocrite herself. She's really just a liar herself. Verse number four. Because remember, she said, oh, yeah, all that money, those 1,100 shekels of silver. Oh, I had already dedicated that. No, she didn't. If she did, then look at verse number four. Why did she only spend 200 shekels to get the idol for him? Look at verse number four. It says, yet he restored the money unto his mother. So she was saying, oh, no, take it. Just keep it all anyways. I was, it was already dedicated. And so he's like, no, 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 here, take it back. So she takes it back and it says, and his mother took 200 shekels of silver and gave them to the founder who made thereof a graven image and a molten image. And they were in the house of Micah. She didn't wholly dedicate that money to the Lord. She was lying. 
Why? Because she wants to look good. She wants to sound good. And she definitely, apparently, doesn't want to have any, any bad feelings going on her son and making him feel guilty at all for what he had done. So instead, she's going to lie to him and say, Oh, no, I was going to all that money was for the Lord. And then it's only 200 shekels. You know what happens when, uh, when people are, I mean, she's, this is really dangerous situation to be in. Now, obviously, you know, I, this lady's unsaved. But what happens when God's people do something similar? We saw that in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 5. When, um, when the house was sold, and then they didn't bring all the money, right? And they conspired together, and they said, Oh, yeah, we sold our house for all this, and we're dedicating it all unto God. But then they keep back some of it. They die. They lose their life. Now, I believe that, that uh, Ananias and Sapphira, I believe they were saved. I believe, I do believe there's, and I'm not going to get into all that. You know, the Bible says they gave up the ghost and, you know, some of the, the, the way that it's described there. I think that they were believers and they were saved. And they just, they were a little greedy. And they liked the glory of men, the praise of men. So they decided to make this, this big public statement that, oh, we're going to give all of this money from the sale of our property. And but no, they really wanted to keep some of it back from themselves. And it's, and it's real similar to what, to what Micah's mother's doing here of saying that, you know, oh, we're going to give that all to the Lord, and then really she's only given a, a small portion of that money. Verse number five, And the man Micah had an house of gods, and made an ephod and teraphim, and consecrated one of his sons who became his priest. So basically he's just surrounding himself with religious things. He's got this whole house of gods. He's got an ephod, a teraphim. He's, he's just got all of these different things that seem, that seem good to have, right? He even makes one of his sons a priest. And, and so obviously we know that he's not some little kid, right? I don't know how old we, he is. But this is the, the, the kid, the child, that didn't get discipline growing up. Because even as an adult, he's stealing this money from, from his mom. And think about that. He's old enough to have a son... Who knows how old he is, but he's got to be old enough to, in some capacity, be a priest, right? I mean, teenager at the youngest, right? To, to be able to do something, to be, a, to be a priest. I mean, reasonably, that, that's what we're looking at. So this guy's like middle-aged, and he's stealing from his, from his mother? 1,100 shekels of silver? What a shame. Yeah, it's too late for him to receive the disciplining. That's, you know, there's definitely no hope for him on the chastening side of things. Well, let's keep reading here. Verse number six, it says, In those days there was no king in Israel, but every man did that which was right in his own eyes. And we're going to see this phrase a few times in the book of Judges where every man does that which is right in his own eyes. Now, God didn't ever ordain for there to be a king in Israel. That wasn't God's plan. They're actually living during the time where things were supposed to be according to God's plan. He's given them freedom, but you see, they're supposed to be doing things. It, it, they still aren't supposed to be doing that which is right in their own eyes. They're supposed to be doing things that are right in the eyes of the Lord. See, they had the freedom because they didn't have a king just enforcing everything, but they did have judges. But God is supposed to be their king during this time. God has given them the law. God's given Micah the law. Micah knew the law. He had all these other spiritual artifacts, but he's breaking the first two commandments of the Ten Commandments. Among others, right? I mean, thou shalt not steal. How about that one? How about honor thy father and thy mother? Yeah, how about that? I mean, just go down the list. There's a problem when every man does just that which is right in his own eyes because everybody thinks that what they do is right. The vast majority of people, if you ask them, are you a good person? Yeah, I'm pretty good. I mean, again, another, another anyone who goes soul winning, why are you going to heaven? When people say, yeah, I'm go I think I'm going to heaven, I'm oh, a pretty good person. I haven't really done anything that bad. I haven't really hurt anybody. 
I've talked to people who have committed murder that have said, yeah, I think I'm a pretty good person. Well, I've made some mistakes. <laughs> Seriously. Like, like everybody thinks, you know, there, there's always an excuse. There's always a reason why, well, I'm not really that bad. Well, you don't just really know me, right? You don't know my heart and, and everything else. And I'm really not that bad. And that's how everybody thinks of themselves. Practically, no matter what they've done, it's very few people that'll say, no, I'm really not good. I mean, there are people out there that say that, but the Bible says in Proverbs 12, 15, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but he that hearkeneth unto counsel is wise. Of course, a fool thinks that everything that they do is right. Proverbs 21, 2 says, every way of a man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord pondereth the hearts. And see, this is, this is key when you understand when the Bible says here, every man did that which is right in his own eyes. They're just doing whatever they want to do. They don't have that, the, the physical, you know, the relation here to not being a king in Israel is just basically saying there's not anyone leading them. You know, at, at times there was a leader. At times you had someone judging that would rise up and, and kind of lead the children of Israel in the right way. But, um, in general, everyone's just doing that which is right in his own eyes. And um, the Bible says in, in, turn if you will to Deuteronomy chapter 6, but in Jeremiah 17 verse 9, the Bible says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? See, when you follow your heart and just do, oh yeah, just I think this seems right or that, that's right. If it's just, if, if all you have is the foundation of, my heart's telling me to do it. That's not a good foundation to have. This seems like it might be right, or I feel like this is right. I feel like I shouldn't really make my child cry when he does wrong. The heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it? And then the Bible says in verse 10, I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. Deuteronomy chapter 6 instructs us that we ought to be doing what's right in God's eyes. It's not about doing what's right in your own eyes. Deuteronomy 6, verse 17 says, Ye shall diligently keep the commandments of the Lord your God and his testimonies and his statutes, which he hath commanded thee. And thou shalt do that which is right and good in the sight of the Lord, that it may be well with thee, and that thou mayest go in and possess the good land which the Lord swear unto thy fathers. This is what the Bible is instructing us. It's not just what's right in your eyes. It's right, it's right in God's eyes. And everyone needs to be thinking about that and applying that with every decision that you make. Is this right in God's eyes? Not, do I think this is right? Does the Bible say this is right? Go back to Judges chapter 17. Look at verse number 7. The Bible says, And there was a young man out of Bethlehem, Judah, of the family of Judah, who was a Levite, and he sojourned there. And the man departed out of the city from Bethlehem, Judah, to sojourn where he could find a place. And he came to Mount Ephraim, to the house of Micah, as he journeyed. And Micah said unto him, Whence comest thou? And he said unto him, I am a Levite of Bethlehem, Judah, and I go to sojourn where I may find a place. And Micah said unto him, Dwell with me, and be unto me a father and a priest, and I will give thee ten shekels of silver by the year, and a suit of apparel, and thy victuals." So the Levite went in, and this is where Roman Catholicism is born. <laughs> Be unto me a father and a priest, right? Be my father. I'll give you a suit of apparel. You can put on this dress, and you can, you can be the, my father and tell me what to do. But also, uh, now again, in, in the context here, I didn't think about this when I was preparing for the sermon, but he's offering this guy 10 shekels a year. One suit of apparel and food. Ten shekels a year salary just to stay with him compared to 1,100 shekels that he stole from his mom. Just to put it in the context of that day of how much money is worth. Like I said, I think it was probably more than $6,000. But basically what's happening here is 
he finds out this guy's a Levite. Bible talks a lot about Levites, right? They're supposed to be these priests. They're, actually, they're not supposed to be. There are certain Levites that are priests, but um, you know, this Levite is uh, probably not of the children of Aaron. He's just uh, going to be a worker of the temple and stuff. But he's like, no, I want you to be my personal priest and, and you're going to come in and be my father. He's all screwed up. He's using things from the Bible like the teraphim, right, and the ephod. And he sees stuff written in the Bible and has no understanding of what it's for or what it means and just thinks that if he surrounds himself with, with spiritual things that it's going to do him well. And that's why I was saying earlier, this isn't like even a, a, a religion. This is more of a superstition than anything else. He, he wants to surround himself with good luck charms. We're almost done... Um, Turn to Matthew 23. I'm going to finish reading Judges chapter 17. Judges 17, 11 says, um, And the Levite was content to dwell with the man, and the young man was unto him as one of his sons. And Micah consecrated the Levite, and the young man became his priest, and was in the house of Micah. Then said Micah, Now know I that the Lord will do me good, seeing I have a Levite to my priest. He's not trusting in what the Bible tells him to trust in. He's just trusting in things. He's trusting in people. He's trusting in this priest. He's trusting in, well, I've got all these graven images and I've got this Levite now and he's going to be my personal priest. That's what he's trusting in. And it's just this, this form of godliness but denying the power thereof. And unfortunately, there's so many people out there today that have the same exact thing. And I can't, I mean, it's just uncanny how much this... I think, equates to the Catholic Church of today. Right. How many elements of this story with having a priest, he's a father, he's got all these idols, all this idolatry. I mean, this is just describing the Catholic Church. And it's people who, you know, have been so deceived and ultimately don't really care about what's true and what Scripture says as much as just... Here's something that's going to make me feel good. I'm going to go out and buy these candles and I'm going to light them and I'm going to bow down and worship this statue and I'm going to you know, do these things that are going to try to make me feel better about myself that I'm actually doing something and earning good credit with God and, and earning merit and earning my way into heaven. That's what that religion is all about. Matthew chapter 23, we see Jesus speaking to the Pharisees. And when you, again, when you look at how the Pharisees behaved, what they're all about, even what they looked like and what they wore, Catholic Church just pops into my mind over and over and over again. It's the same type of person. It doesn't matter that these are Jews and that the Catholics are, are supposedly Christian. The Jews supposedly worship the Lord. Did they really? No. Did they have the Father? Well, they didn't have the Son. And Jesus said, if you don't have the Son, you don't have the Father. So, of course, they didn't, they didn't worship the Lord. Just like the Catholics, they don't have the Son. And they don't have the Father. And, and there, that, there's so many similarities between these false prophets and these false teachers. Look at Matthew 23, verse number 1. The Bible says, Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore, whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. But do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne and lay them on men's shoulders. But they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. But all their works they do for to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments and love the uppermost rooms at feasts and the chief seats in the synagogues and greetings in the markets and to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi. But be not ye called Rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and all ye are brethren. And call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. Neither be ye called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. So just as the Jews, they have rabbis, they call themselves rabbis, Jesus is saying, don't call yourself rabbi. That's a title given unto Christ. And the Catholic is saying, don't call, don't call any man father, because there's one father. Don't be using these titles. 
Don't be ascribing them to yourself. One, of you, one is your father in heaven. And don't be called masters. Jesus continues to rail against his father. And look, they're doing everything just to be seen of men. That's why they have their special clothing so everyone knows, oh, you're a holy man of God. You're a priest. And they're not out there doing the work. They're not out there doing all the, the good deeds and stuff. And whatever they do do, they only do it to be seen of men. And they love the greetings. Oh, Father, this is Father so-and-so. How do you know he's Father so-and-so? Because he's got his collar turned around backwards and he's wearing a dress. That's how you know who he is. He's enlarged the borders of his garments. They make broad their phylacteries. They love the uppermost rooms at feasts. They love being honored. Jump down to verse 25. Jesus continues railing against these false prophets, these really religious but really wicked people. And the way the Pharisees are described, like I said before, it reminds me so much of the Catholic Church. Let's keep reading here, verse number 25. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you make clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Even so ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. This is what the false prophet looks like. This is... This is what the Catholic pedophile looks like. On the outside, they look real good. And so many people trust them and, oh, Father so-and-so, bless his heart. He's just so kind and so nice. But just like the, the grave, just like the sepulcher that's adorned real nice and real fancy, on the outside, on the inside, it's just full of stinking uh, dead men's bones that are rotting away that you'd never want to actually open it up and look at because it stinks, it's wretched, it's foul, it's decaying. You wouldn't want to go near that. But on the outside, it looks great. And that's the way he's describing these priests. In our day, these, these pedophiles, yeah, on the outwardly, they look to be righteous. But in the inside, they're extremely wicked and vile and perverted and disgusting. And Jesus is calling them out. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because ye build the tombs of the prophets and garnish the sepulchres of the righteous, and say, If we had been in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Wherefore ye be witnesses unto yourselves that ye are the children of them which killed the prophets. Fill ye up then the measure of your fathers. Ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? That's some serious condemnation from Jesus Christ on these false prophets. These are the wicked people that they've gotten involved in idolatry. They've rejected the Lord. On the inside, they're, they're the wolves. On the outside, they look like sheep. On the inside, they're wolves. These are the people that Jesus warns us about. And tying this all back in to the chapter here, we've got Micah. Now, I'm not saying that Micah is himself a false prophet. He could just be very deceived. But the problem is that the false prophets are deceiving these types of people into trusting in all of these artifacts and in all of these things and, and steering them away from the truth. Now, I don't know if Micah just came up with all of this stuff out of his own heart. It's very well possible because of the way he was raised. He wasn't brought up right from a child. So he's just letting his heart lead him And he thinks he's going to do good by all of these artifacts and by all of his idols. Idolatry is wicked, needs to be railed against. Children need to be raised right. And uh, today, as much as any other time in history, these things need to be thundered home. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for, um, for all the instruction that you give us in your word. pray that you would please just help us to do a good job and be diligent uh, all on our own to be able to read your word and to apply it to our life, dear God. Help us to understand the things that we don't understand and 
Uh, Lord, help us to teach our children right and well and to uh, apply the appropriate discipline and chastening when it's necessary. And I pray that you would please just help us never to be deceived by idolatry and help us to lead others that, are, that have been deceived uh, out of that and, and help us to, to show them the truth, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.